Well, I hope that's whetted the appetite. I know there's great anticipation for this panel because we're going to try and cover a huge amount in just one hour. We have fabulous panelists. We are talking about no less than the Jacques Delors legacy for the future of the single market. That's why we've got this back to the future theme because we're going to look to the past and then try and bring it to the fore. So. I won't delay any longer. I will call to our stage, of course, Enrico Letta, the high-level rapporteur on the future of the single market and former Prime Minister of Italy, but here to talk to us about that report today. Thank you very much, sir. If you take a seat <laughs> under your... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We also have, representing one of our hosts, we have uh, Guy Verhofstadt, Member of the European Parliament and former Prime Minister of our current country here as well. Thank you very much, Guy. <laughs> Joining us from Institut Jacques Delors, the uh, Deputy Head of the Union of Citizens dit, Dialogue and the European <laughs> Commission former Secretary General of the Institut Jacques Delors, Gaëtan ricard Neol. Please, Gaëtan. And last, but by no means least, Pascal Lamy, Vice President of the Paris Peace Forum now, and of course well known to us here in Brussels, and coordinator of the Jacques Delors Think Tank in Paris, Berlin and Brussels, and of course, former DG of WTO and former Trade Commissioner, a very long CV. <laughs> so, uh, Enrico, let me start with you. Um, this is about the legacy of Jacques Delors. Um, tell us about what was the core of his approach and what was his advice to you? I know when you're drawing up this report, you will be thinking about that. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, the, for this event. It's a great event and uh, uh, having the possibility to, to listen, uh, to listen, Pascal, Gaetan, they worked with Jacques Delors when Jacques Delors was uh, the president of the commission, and uh, Jacques Delors was the president of uh, uh, Notre Europe. Uh, but I, I had the opportunity to, to meet Jacques Delors in the last years, in the last eight years, when I, as president of the Jacques Delors Institute, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, the afternoon, four o'clock, Rue Saint-Jacques. Uh, and in July, when I was in July there, uh, was necessary to wait the end of the Tour de France etape uh, uh, before starting talking. Uh, I, of course, there are so many uh, lessons, of course, legacies, but I have to say that if I have to choose one, if I have to choose one, for me, the most, the, the strongest message of Jacques Delors about Europe, first of all, but in general about life, about politics, about uh, social life, is the, is the importance and the predominance of the nous au lieu du je. And in the world of today, I think it's a very strong message. Uh, the collective exercise, the way in which, as president of the commission, he was able to mobilize energies pushing people to work together, even very, very different people working together. He was fantastic in dealing with the British. He was fantastic in... I was yesterday in, uh, in Copenhagen, in my Tour d'Europe for the uh, single market report. I spent one day in, in Copenhagen, and it was fantastic how strong is the legacy of the, of the law in uh, Denmark, because he was able to mobilize energies, every energy, and to make people working together. And uh, his commission was a collective exercise, and um, his legacy at the end of the day is the legacy of someone who was able to allow people to work and to take uh, really the best from anyone. And uh, I think it is, for me, one of the most important part of the work uh, and uh, it's, it's a great lesson for, for today, uh, because I have to say that today we are exactly in the opposite world, in a world in which everywhere is the mirror uh, and not uh, the general uh, uh, discussion, and uh, we are always in, a, in places where the most important part is if I am quoted, if I am quoted, I agree 
with what you said. If not, uh, I don't agree. If, I, if, I'm, if my image is there, it's good. Otherwise, I don't care about what you are telling or what you are discussing. And at the end of the day, I think it's a great message for today's uh, politics and, I have to say, for today's Europe. So I, I very, or we say, in a very modest way, I'm trying to uh, bring this message, uh, first of all, in this uh, single market work, uh, trying to meet people. I have to say, and I stop here immediately, it is the most fascinating exercise I've never, have ever done. Uh, visiting the 27 countries, and not only the European Union countries, but also Oslo, also the US, uh, London, uh, Switzerland, uh, meeting people, governments, stakeholders, students. I leave now to go to the College de Bruges. Uh, meeting students from university, different universities, meeting uh, people in the, uh, in, the, in the ministries and people in the trade unions, people in the companies and people, uh, citizens. Uh, I think I, at the end of this exercise, 17 of April, I will say, uh, frankly speaking, at the end of this exercise, of course I hope that my recommendations will uh, become reality or some part of them be become reality, but personally I will say, Wow, Europe is great. Europe is fantastic. It's so rich. It's so full of great people, great ideas. And this diversity is our really great asset. Well, it sounds exhausting, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Guy, let me turn to you, because we do live in a different world. Um, you mentioned the politics of the time 30 years ago. We live in a different political world, and public opinion is different. There is, a, if you want to say, growing or at least existing Euroscepticism in certain member states. How, and, 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 so, and a certain reticence to further integration. How do we cope with that? How do we overcome that? And, well, um, I think by um, doing it uh, like uh, Delors did it, because uh, I want uh, first uh, to go back a little bit uh, to, to Jacques Delors. Um, what I remember is, uh, is the slogan, 1982. You know, everybody was waiting, ah, in 1982 something will happen. And uh, it happened. Uh, and uh, it was in fact an operation the single market, the white book, uh, the, the 1982, 92. that uh, that combined um, has uh, got the possibility to overcome an energy and an inflation crisis we were in at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. And afterwards, we got, again, um, uh, growth figures of, of uh, more than 3%. So it worked at that moment. And it was with a very ambitious program. Not that he got everything what he wanted. And that is my lesson from the law. You have to ask 100% in politics to obtain more or less 30, 35. Uh, because that is what he got from the member states. And uh, uh, not everything what he wanted uh, was realized. And the problems that we have today, and that's the reason why Enrico Letta is making a report on it, is that uh, we have still not a single market uh, in, in all the sectors, in all the products, in all the services that we need. And we have a single market mainly in the old stuff. We have not a single market in the new stuff, in, the, in digital, in uh, capital services, in, uh, in telecom. Mm. Uh, uh, and, but he wanted that. And it were the member states who said, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's, that's a national interest. You cannot do that uh, on spectrum, uh, on telecom. You cannot do that on the financial services. You cannot do that uh, uh, on, on a number of other issues. Uh, so uh, an other, a number of other goods. So what is so important now is that uh, we go back to the initial idea of the law. I hope that that will be the conclusion of uh, Andy Colette's report. Uh, saying we need to go back to that initial idea and uh, to open all these uh, sectors, services and goods that are still hindered by uh, the absence of uh, a, single, uh, a single market. And where we are successful with the European economy for the moment, there there is a single market. Where we are not successful with the European economy, we lack the single market. So it seems to me then easy uh, to conclude that we need to open these, uh, these closed uh, 
parts uh, of uh, our industry and of our uh, economy. And that's for me the, 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 the main task, I hope, in the, uh, in the future. And, and, and again, uh, the lesson is ask 100%, then maybe you will have 30, 35 or 40%. I don't think you'll hear any dissent from that in this room. I think everyone here is, is very much in favor of deeper integration. Um, I think where we see the skepticism is perhaps at different member states rather than sitting in auto world in Brussels. Um, but Gaetan, drawing from your experience at the, the Jacques Delors Institute and your role now at the Commission, um, how do you perceive the public's understanding? Because it's not, I mean, yes, we want political buy-in, yes, we want industry and business engagement, but we need the public engagement as well. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I'm actually very, very honored and actually moved as well to be able to, to share this moment and, and bring Jacques Delors uh, with us in this room <laughs> and, and his legacy. Um, and um, I, I perhaps I, I wanted to recall two of the his, his references, maybe uh, uh, compasses, uh, to use the, the logo of the Jacques Delors Institute, you know, uh, when we think the, the future of the single market. And one of them was very much quoted uh, when he passed away and also during the ceremony uh, that, that was held in the European Commission is this triptych, you know, uh, competition that stimulates cooperation, that strengthens, and solidarity that unites. And I, 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 I say it again because I think there is no better a compass, I think, still today, to think the future of the of the single market. And but it means also to wonder what does it mean today competition, what does it mean today cooperation, what does it mean today solidarity. Uh, and of course, another of his compass was. Um, in, his, in his idea of the European Federation of Nation States uh, and this idea of the concept of subsidiarity, you know, that decision should be taken as close as possible to the citizen. I can come back to that later because it's a big concept, but I think it's also interesting to think the, the future. Uh, but you asked me about the, 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 the larger public and the citizens' view. I can't talk for the citizens, but I can tell you what I have uh, studied in the Eurobarometer, both quantitative, qualitative surveys, and also I have seen an experience uh, during the citizens' participation uh, experiments uh, that we had uh, in, the, in the past year and we continue to have during the Conference of the Future of Europe, but also uh, this weekend, actually, we are opening a new European Citizens Panel on Energy Efficiency. Um, so uh, we, we feel what people say, and uh, I'd like to share three ideas that come out uh, quite regularly and are, are, should be taken into account maybe when thinking the future of the single market. The, the first one that, that comes out again and again, actually, uh, still today, is the feeling sometimes of some heterogeneity between the member states. So I think that uh, Jacques Delors was uh, saying that what was important when the single market was launched is that at the same time they was, were launched the cohesion funds. And it, it's something that we need to, to keep in mind. Second idea uh, that comes again and again when citizens talk about the, the single market it's how do we do now to reconcile the principle, the, the main principle of the single market, the free movement, with uh, the project of the Green New Deal and the climate uh, ambitions. I, it was the subject of your previous panel. Um, but I think uh, two, two very basic elements that come, come, come again and again with the citizens is um, how do we reconcile with uh, the free movement with the idea of circular economy and also the need to go more and more towards local and seasonal products, that comes a lot. Uh, I know it seems <laughs> quite basic, but for them it's important to understand. And the second is, we, it's very much based on the idea that free movement and mobility is good, but also today we see with the climate CO2 emissions, is it still good? And if, if not, uh, if it's not so straightforward, shouldn't we think it differently? Maybe uh, what does mobility and free movement mean today uh, with the constraint that we have? And finally, a, a third idea I would like to share uh, is more about how the single market is positioned towards the global market and, and the mm. rest of the world. I think there is a perception among citizens that uh, there is a protection inside the EU. I think they put forward, the, they recognize that there is quality standards, common standards that are, that are important with some heterogeneity, I was, as I was saying previously, but they see that 
inside we are protected with good quality thanks to the single market, but there is not the perception that um, the, the, um, there is the perception towards the global market that we are still too vulnerable. I'm, again, I'm here I'm talking about perception, I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it's a, a necessarily a reality. Um, so that we need also, there is the feeling that it should be clearer what the EU is doing also to protect the interests outside um, and to be less vulnerable when it comes to dependencies, imports, etc. So I think it's really three ideas I wanted to share because they are common to the studies that I, I have read and also to the, the, the direct exchange it could have with citizens. There's a lot to unpack there. I think we'll come back to some of those points. Um, Pascal, let me turn to you. In your long CV, uh, I also missed out that you were head of cabinet to the great man. Uh, so I'm interested in your assessment of how the single market has evolved since Jacques Delors' tenure. Well, that's a very long story. I mean, <laughs> the story of how the 1992 single market accrued is well known. Delors, when he was uh, nominated president of the Commission after the Fontainebleau European Council in mid-84, was looking for one idea to re-energize European integration. Uh, that was the starting point. And we had a lot of brainstorming and discussions with a small team that he had started together. And then he went into a tour de capital among the uh, 10 uh, member states, plus the two candidates, Spain and Portugal, with a menu of options. <coughs> Currency, defense, culture, uh, energy, and the single market. And the reason why the single market was on the list was that the European Roundtable, which at the time was already quite well organized, and uh, Stevie d'Avignon, who was the outgoing uh, commissioner for the common market, and who was to become the president of the commission if Delors had not uh, trumped it, uh, thanks to clever maneuvering of Mitterrand at the end of the uh, European Council. Uh, Stevie d'Avignon, instead of feeling this as a problem for him, helped the law a lot to conceive this internal market issue. So then the Tour de Capital and the Germans, when the law said currency, Germans said no, no way, never. <laughs> uh, and when the law said uh, defense, Andreotti said no, 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 way too costly. And then uh, when uh, he consulted the French, uh, French energy, oh, no, 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 never, <laughs> this is too national. Uh, and then uh, when he said uh, culture, uh, the UK said, what, the federal culture, never. So at the end of the day, the remaining <laughs> bit was a consensus uh, without all these devils that had been you know, pushed away a consensus was on the internal market. So that's the story. It's well known, but I think it's a good and en ent enter into the question. Then I think the important question is why did it work? And this is a sort of legacy discussion. Now, my own explanation of why it did work is that it was an extremely coherent model within the law's brain. It was a model with three basic elements which were specifically DeLorean in their mix. An ideological vision, classical Nordic social democratic vision, economic sustainability needs social sustainability and social sustainability needs economic sustainability, to put it very simply. That was his view. The environmental sustainability only came later in the, in the 90s, and he left Brussels in 95 with this third layer of sustainability. Second element of this model, politics are about arranging cohesion between the state, social partners, and local authorities. 
the four of them, social partners being two, mm -hmm. industry and trade unions, have to find a consensus that politically sustains, support this ideological vision. And then the third element, which is a method, a methodology. And on this, uh, a guy like Max Konstam, uh, who many of you may not know, but was uh, a close advisor to Jean Monnet, and who became a good friend of Jacques Delors at the end of his life, helped him conceiving this notion that you have to combine a target, removing borders. That was the popular way of realizing the internal market. A date, 1992, to be announced quite soon in advance. A plan, and Lord Cofield, uh, who was the internal market commissioner, had to write a telephone book, uh, which he did very very well, as an accountant he was, with everything that needed to be done to have an internal market and remove these bloody borders. And then institutional and financial capacities. Only then, only at the end of the Milan European Council, when the plan was adopted, the law started saying, <clears throat> yeah, next time I'll have to tell you a bit more about how we need to do that. And hence came the Luxembourg Single Act, and then came the doubling of the structural funds for reasons of cohesion. So I'm insisting on this because I deeply believe that the reason why it worked was because of these simple, in a way, elements of which complex machinery which he had in his mind. And then the lesson for today, I believe, is that uh, we now have to have the same coherence between, let's say, similar elements, although <laughs> we are a few years later, but of course in a context which has totally changed. Huh? We have uh, the environmental dimension, uh, we have uh, a war in uh, Ukraine, uh, we have a whole bunch of economic security issues. Uh, having uh, now come uh, to the fore. We have populist movements which we did not have at the time, so I'm not saying it's the same. It has to be adjusted to a very different context, but the coherence between being able to explain clearly what we want to do, getting enough, let's say, 60% support in public opinion, and being able to say where we are as compared to the objective, I think this remains. Well, let's take that, if you like, uh, Delora methodology, if we can call it that. I mean, we can set aside the target. We, we know what that is. We can set aside the date because 92 was 30 plus years ago. Um, but let's look at what you were talking about, the stakeholders, Enrico. And I'm interested to know whether you see the role for, if you like, the, 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 the policymakers or the authorities, the national authorities, businesses and civil society, whether they can still be viewed through the same prism as was the case in Jacques Delors' day, or whether there's been a seismic shift in, in terms of who plays what role. You know, I, I have the feeling that in our society, uh, we are uh, more in advance, it is usually like that, but we are more in advance than the political classes today and than the political leaderships. I give you just an example. I had many meetings with entrepreneurs, for instance, uh, since the beginning of my uh, exercise on how to speed up, how to uh, be more effective, more concrete, and so on and so forth. And they told me, but please go to the US and to see how IRA is working and why it's working. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we want to have something like IRA. And it is, I think, good to have this kind of uh, uh, wish. And I visited uh, DC, I met the people of IRA, I met the, the architect of IRA. And I have to say that at the end of the day, we are all aware that the very strength and the big asset of IRA is the fact that uh, it is based on tax credits. So it is very fast, automatic, responsibility of the entrepreneur, and very low um, uh, and very weak, uh, we say, uh, link with the bureaucracy and with the, the administration. 
But to do so, you need more Europe. It is as simple as that. <laughs> so, when you go to a government, a government tells you that hey, uh, taxation is me, huh? it's not... Uh... And I have to say that this example for me is very interesting. Because I come back from, from the conclusions of Pascal. Um, I think the main, today the main obstacle of everything and uh, is the fact that we are uh, at the end, we hope, at the end of four years of crazy world in which we uh, had crisis, uh, healthcare crisis, COVID, uh, energy crisis, the war, and, and so on and so forth. And I have the feeling that today, with all these crises, and of course with the memory of the crisis of 8 and of 11, 11 more than 8, uh, in each government, there's a sort of instinct, and the instinct is the following one. And each, when I say each government, I say France, I say Belgium, the two Belgium, I say Italy, I say Germany, I say Malta. A prime minister wants to have in his pocket five telephone numbers. And these five tele telephone numbers, they have to be two telephone numbers of the uh, CEO of a national bank with the national flag of the country. A telephone number of a telecom uh, operator with the national flag of uh, his country. An energy operator with the national flag of your country. And you want to have these five telephone numbers because you say that for the next crisis, when in a weekend you have to, uh, you, you will risk your post, your position, because everything is changing, and you have to uh, be Napoleon, eh? and you have to, uh, in one day, to give your people the sense that you are the commander in chief, and so you have these four numbers, five numbers, you call them and you say, now I am the commander and you obey and you do so, one, two, three, four. And he needs to have, at the end of the day, first of all, people answering the call. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> and this is why, <coughs> for him, it's absolutely necessary to have people with the national flag. Because if he has people, uh, he is, yes, CEO of your country, but of a multinational uh, with many different countries and so on. Maybe he will say, but uh, I have no reason to answer uh, because we are Sunday, so maybe call tomorrow and so on. But I think at the end of the day, it's not a joke. Uh, what I want to say, it is mm. not a joke. It is the truth. One of the main reasons it is, and this is also for home, host topics related to the financial system and so on. So it's big and small countries everywhere in Europe. The big need is the fact that the political legitimacy at the end of the day comes from the national level. And so the one who sits in the Council, in the European Council, is there because he is elected at national level. And he is there, and at the end of the day this is his main topic is to be sure that he can, and I'm sorry to say that, but we are still in 2016, he has to take control. This is the key topic. As for the Brexit, take back control, that was the uh, most important topic. So I have to say that um, this is the main obstacle. This is the main obstacle. Uh, because for any government and any politician at national level, the main message is, I, I have to protect my citizens. And I completely share. It was my mission when I was there, it was your mission when you were there. Uh, the key point is, is the national dimension the one in which you protect your citizen? Or is a different dimension in which you can protect him? And is the, uh, the national flag and the national borders protecting the national... I always remember this call for action of Xavier Bettel, Prime Minister of Luxembourg mm -hmm. during the, cri the COVID crisis, saying that you uh, close the borders, you kill our people. 
you are responsible for killing our people. Because closing the borders of Luxembourg was the way to kill their people in the hospitals because of nurses coming from one country to another and so on and so forth. And I think at the end of the day, this is the key point. And when I say this, it's very easy to say, but it's very complicated uh, because at the end of the day, it's the very core of the political legitimacy. This is why it is absolutely necessary to overcome this just national legitimacy and this idea that uh, uh, a political national leader is there because he is able to be commander-in-chief of his own country. But the need to be part of a collective European leadership. This is why it is necessary to have messages, first of all coming from uh, from the ground, if I may say, coming from the uh, companies. From uh, It was very strong, the message. Uh, two days ago, I was with, uh, with von der Leyen and de Croo in Antwerp, uh, at the border with uh, uh, the Netherlands, uh, at this European Industrial Summit. And uh, the, the entrepreneurs, the CEOs there, very, were very vocal in saying that to the leaders, saying that I don't care the national flag now, I, I need answers. So I think at the end of the day, this is the strength of, of the message. And I hope the legacy of Jacques Delors can be uh, uh, very useful in that. The relationship to results and the method of screwdriver and the relationship with, with, uh, with results. Well, thank you for that. Um, Guy, I'm going to pick up on quite a lot <laughs> of what Enrico has just said there uh, in my question to you, because I'm drawing on your previous experience as Prime Minister, but now with your hat as President of the European Movement International, what do you see as the role of civil society organisations, obviously as representatives of society, but also perhaps as those responsible for delivering messages about what's happening as well? Uh, because let's be honest, there's a lot of capitals that when they're going to do something unpopular with a small p, just go, ah, oh, Brussels made me do it. It's that fig leaf. And that is not necessarily helping with the engagement towards gaining public support for deeper integration? I, I think that, that inside the civil society in, in general, there is far more support uh, for uh, an idea like the single market and the extension of the single market than in the political world. Yeah. I don't see the problem <laughs> in, the, in the civil society. I see the problem in the political world. I know. And, 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 and to, be, uh, to react a little bit to what uh, uh, Mr. Letta said and Nicholas said, the, the prime ministers are not the, even the baddest of all. Huh? Uh, uh, the, the baddest of all are the ministers of finance in this story uh, of uh, the single market. And, and justice uh, too. Uh, and, and then uh, well, maybe the, the ministers of industry. Uh, and, and then you put them together and there you have the resistance. Uh, why we have still more than 100 telecom operators in Europe? Why? Why we have uh, roaming still? In, in, in Europe, in the, the, the States, it's very clear. There are, there are three big or four big mobile operators. In China, there are three or four big mobile operators. If you want to roll out something on mobile, you make a deal with these three, four guys, and you do it immediately. And how you do it in Europe? Well, yeah, you're, you're, you start, and uh, it's a, a work of years before you have an agreement with more than 100 uh, mobile operators. It's the same to have uh, the, the, the authorization of... Uh, uh, of, uh, of those who are regulating the, 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 the market. In America, it's simple. You have FCC. You go to FCC, and if they say yes, okay, you can roll out. In you know, Europe, not. Uh, in Europe, you, uh, you have 27 doors uh, to knock on uh, before you can do exactly the same rollout of your fantastic invention that, uh, that you want to put uh, uh, on, on, on the market. And, uh, but it's, it's true, as Anika said, it's, it's that reaction, oh yeah, that's my, that's my business, that's my, and the ministers of finance, that's finance, eh? money, so spectrum, ah, that needs to be uh, national. In fact, that, that, that should be something European, and the income of the, of, the, of the tenders would be a good income for the European Union, and then you would have a real uh, telecom uh, integrated market. And then, based on that, you create a European FCC and you would have a, a real uh, European digital uh, market. And look to the reality, the stock market value of, of, of technological companies and digital companies worldwide. There is no European one of, 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 of an important side because of that. 
So because we don't have a single market, a real single market, in financial services, in capital, uh, raising exactly uh, the same uh, problem. And the problem is that these national uh, ministers of finance, what if I, I talk about uh, European arrest warrant, then I will talk about the ministers of justice, that they have exactly the same reaction for, for their competence. The problem is that they, we, are, we are still thinking that, uh, uh, that these... Uh, um, elements are from national interest. They are not from national interest. There's a European interest today in the world. This is not a world of nation states anymore. Can maybe you forget that we live in a world of nations? We live in a world of empires for the moment, not of nation states. And as an individual nation state inside the European Union, you will defend nothing. Sovereignty means nothing anymore on the national level in these elements. And, and not to talk about defense, because that's still another uh, story. This, and there, there is our problem. Is there a problem with uh, the, uh, the public opinion and the civil society? I, did, uh, I was co-chair of the Conference on the Future of, uh, of Europe, and instead of what people are saying, that there are Eurosceptics and Europhiles and that there will be a clash, I didn't see nothing about that in the Conference on the Future of Europe. All these people said, we like Europe, we know that Europe is a solution, but not this Europe. That was mainly the conclusion of the conference. And there was no clash between skeptics and, and Europhiles in, in these uh, 800 people in, in total uh, who, who were gathering and who found solutions with more than 70% of agreement. So uh, you can even change the constitution in most countries with uh, uh, such uh, uh, an approval rate. So the problem is political. Uh, political uh, are, are still or national leaders who think that they will solve the problems in a world who is globalized and who has to deal with a completely other challenges than 30 or 40 years ago. Well, let me say, let me suggest that perhaps people who attend a council on or, or a conference on the future of Europe are self-selecting and possibly are rather pro-European. Um, uh, so th that's Gaetan. The, the, yeah, Gaetan was a selecting <laughs> authority here, yeah? so that's not true. <laughs> But those who would show up have interest. Gaetan, tell me a bit about, anyway, the, the, the feedback that you're getting from these sorts of interactions. Uh, it's interesting. I, I really need to, to correct what you just said, because it, <laughs> and the phone number uh, image is interesting, because for this weekend, to bring the 150 citizens that will come to Brussels, uh, it, 180,000 phone calls were made. Uh, <laughs> So this is what you call random selection. It's uh, randomly generated phone numbers bringing people and we constitute a group who is representative of diversity. So mm -hmm. certainly not the usual suspects, if I may so, uh, <laughs> and the people who would agree. And we now have uh, statistics because it's not a hard criteria, but it's a question we ask, what the attitude towards the EU, and we have a exactly the same response as in the Uber barometer. So the, the, the same share of neutral, uh, positive or negative. So no, it doesn't work okay. to say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> and sorry, you were asking because then I got... Well, I want you to build on, on, on what Guy was saying. You know, the, it's the prime ministers aren't the bad guys, maybe not even the, the finance ministers, but what is the perception um, in bringing institutions, whether they be national, yeah. regional, or at EU level, closer to citizens with the idea of encouraging this uh, integration? Well, I think it was, it's a perfect transition for me what was said because you know that the EU is based on a double legitimacy. One coming from the member states, and I think we talked a lot about the member states until now, and another one from citizens directly with the European Parliament, of course, uh, and we will have a very important election very soon. We are still in a representative democracy, of course, but also there is a, a will from citizens nowadays to be more associated, more regularly to policymaking, and we had this experience in the conference, which was indeed very, very interesting and very innovative, changing the perspective. I think this is what we need now. We need to look at things differently, and citizens help us to do that. So my answer would be, if you want citizens to trust the EU, trust the project, trust them as well. And I think the conference, the future of Europe, was a, a good example. And we are we are continuing you now with with the panel showing that um, that it um, that it works. Um, and because I wanted to to bring also this idea that you know we we should not consider the the method uh, as it was at at the time because. Even if the Single European Act was, as Jacques Delors would say, his favourite treaty, 
there were others afterwards, and one Maastricht Treaty, very important, who cre which created the European citizenship. You know? So I think we need also to think the future of the, of the single market with the EU as it is now, and this double legitimacy, and how do we bring the citizen in, but it's by trusting them, associating them also, and giving them a seat at the table, if I can use that, uh, that expression. Pascal, let's talk uh, very practically about how the single market can remain relevant in terms of the global economy. What are your thoughts on that? Well, let me first say that I'm not sure I agree with Gaetan that uh, the exercise uh, she organized with the Commission was successful. Which one? The Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, if it had been successful, a few things which both Enrico and Guy uh, mentioned would have changed. But that's not they part of the They have not citizens. changed. We are still in the same political paradigm as the one they have uh, described, which is public opinion being somewhere, but national reluctances to European integration being represented by politicians. This is the reality. By the way, it was the reality at the time of Delors. Right. But Delors, in a way, circumvented this issue in not saying, we have to get rid of your national identity. Mm. He said, we need growth and job. Don't you agree with that? Oh, yeah, we need growth and job. Where can the EU grow more is in making the EU markets more efficient. Hence, the single market. And then the proof that it did create jobs and it did allow the social model to improve. So there was nothing of like, a, I mean, in, in the narrative of this, there was nothing like Brussels taking control over member states. Although, when you look at the reality, a large part of their capacity to regulate uh, was uh, transferred to Brussels. But that was the result, not the purpose. Mm -hmm. And he very, very carefully avoided any fight on this, including, for instance, in not including energy into the internal market. Huh? It's not that he proposed it and it did not happen. He did not propose it because he thought that mm -mm -mm, there you were but nearing... It, was, it was on his list, like you said. Of course. But he it was, was on his initial list. He knew he was getting very near to the, to the tiger's cage. Oh. Huh? And that, mm -mm, that was dangerous. Now, what is the reasoning now? I think the reasoning basically remains the same. If we want to sustain our social model, which is the identity of Europe in the world, we need more growth. I don't think, and I regret it, but I don't think in 20, 50, 100 years from now, we will be able to keep the superiority of our economic social model, social market without more growth. The problem being that it remains about growth, but the conditions of growth and the nature of growth have changed. A, because of sustainability, B, because of our demographic problems, uh, which is the main reason why we have a slower growth than elsewhere. And third, and this has to do with a new element of the efficiency of the economy, which is our very low innovation capacity. Not that there does not remain efficiencies to be gained in completing the single market, including in the services sector, and that has been said. I think the fundamental reality today is that we have not put the notion of the single market at the use of a higher innovation capacity. Okay. Uh, and this is where the single market interacts with the rest of the world. And my answer to your question on this is very simple. Given the structural reasons of our low growth for the moment, we absolutely need still to go and pick growth elsewhere. 
One of the reasons why the EU needs a more open economy than China or than the US, who have their own formidable engines of growth, is that, and one of the reasons why on economic security we have to be more careful about the implied trade-offs than the US or China, is that we need to keep peaking growth on the part of the world which is growing more and sometimes much more than us. And I think if we don't understand that, if we remain with this, this sort of you know, European bubble and not answer your question, we will have a big problem. Enrico, um, I know we're rapidly running out of time. I, I knew it would happen, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you at least to speak a little bit about the principle of the right to stay that you floated. Uh, just because it can be co-opted and, and misunderstood. Tell us a bit about it, please. Uh, just to say that uh, I, I think we, we are having in this very period uh, a discussion about how to deal with the single market and European Union that is very clearly uh, showing that there's a, a sort of asymmetry uh, between a large part of our European citizens very much in love with Europe and the single market because they are, by definition, uh, mobile, very cosmopolitan, and the European Union single market is perceived as a great boost to do so. But we have to be aware that there's a part of our population, our people, living mostly in some countries or in some re regions in some countries, uh, they have the feeling that, or they don't perceive, or maybe nobody at the national government is, is really explaining what are the benefits for them of what the European Union and the single market uh, is bringing, are bringing. And uh, there's the feeling that at the end of the day, the single market and European Union is bringing more, uh, I would say, uh, weakening of services of general interest, uh, lack of infrastructures because everything is reducing in the peripheral regions. In my old village, 40 years ago, I had uh, banks, I had hospital, I had, and now I have nothing. And the feeling that uh, everything is moving and changing in favor of those who are mobile and the European Union is talking mostly to them. I add one consideration, that is the fact that we are experiencing uh, a brain drain that is becoming a spoliation, if I may say. Because when I see the figures for some countries in Europe and some regions within some countries, it is not brain drain. Because when one country is losing more than 10% of its population in 10 years, I think we have to be aware that the destiny of this country, the future of this country, is in big difficulty. Because this part, the part of the population that this country is losing, is the best skilled part and so on and so forth. So, I think we have to put together the two. A freedom to stay uh, and freedom to move. And put together insisting so the on the term freedom. We are free. Nobody has to oblige you to stay or to move, you are free. But it is very important to help, first of all, these countries to re-attract people. Because this brain drain today, this is the key issue, is a one-way ticket. If you take these countries or, or these regions, people leaving and without any uh, people coming and without the possibility to come back. So. I know it's complicated, and I, saw, I know also it, 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 it can be misunderstood. But I am really convinced, if we are not able to address this very strong social issue related to... Take another example. Now we are opening uh, the enlargement uh, procedure, mm -hmm. and, and the future will be the enlargement. But I was in the streets, and I heard uh, farmers some days ago. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I had the feeling that farmers, some, some weeks ago, they said two things. First, uh, you decided to enlarge, yes, but I don't want to pay for the enlargement. And today we are giving the message that the enlargement will be paid with present uh, money that is for poorest region, 
in the actual, in the present member states. This is the feeling that is growing, and it is, of course, a very bad feeling. We need clearly to say that cohesion policy will stay, and it will be for the future an important realization for the European Union, and the enlargement will be done with uh, other meanings, not uh, with the today, uh, because we can't say that today we are, uh, I would say, uh, allowing poorest countries and we are uh, making poorer countries that are poorer today. Mm. And it's, it, it doesn't work. And the other, but the other main point, I, I'm very short on that, but I would like to, to mention it, because for me, it's also one of the, of the big challenges for my report, is to link the completion of the what we said, Capital Markets Union, to the answer to the question who will pay for the green and the digital transition. For a very simple reason, the other, uh, we say, reaction of the farmers, and the farmers are the first group of people today in the streets. And I don't want that they can be the first in a sequence, in a row. But at the end of the day, what they say, they say, one, you decided to go uh, to go green and to go digital. So you decided to have the transition. You, people, uh, decision makers. Uh, second, you told us that the transition will cost 800 billion euros per year. It is a figure, it is an official figure from the Commission. Third, you didn't say anything on how to find this money. Because this money is there just for the next two years, next generation EU. And then, after that, who knows? Then, fourth, I don't want to pay for it. I, farmer, or today another group of people, and uh, to, to, today's politics and today's political discussion is pre preventive. Uh, so they, they are not waiting for the consequences. They are saying in a preventive way, uh, it's not me. It's not me. And I think if we are not able, in this electoral year, I say that very clearly, to find solutions to that, this electoral year will be a very complicated socially and political year. And I think this is fundamental today because if we are not able to, to give an answer to this contradiction, uh, I'm afraid for the future of, of the next months. I, th I think... Yeah. <laughs> I think it's interesting that you're really delineating that. I mean, when you've talked about, you know, this freedom means more than one thing. There's freedom from and freedom to. So freedom to move and freedom to stay, but freedom from restrictions or surveillance or whatever that may be, or the feeling of being restricted or limited by others' freedoms. So a difficult balance for the European elections to get that message across. We are at the limit of our time. Have we any questions in the room? Oh my gosh, I thought we might. Um, okay, so we have one here in the second row. I'm afraid I'm going to give the floor to people who haven't spoken before. So uh, the gentleman there in the middle as well, and then another one further back. We will take these three, and then we will see how we get on, because I know Mr. Lamy has another engagement to rush to. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much. It's been such an interesting discussion. It's a real privilege to be here with you. Um, my name is Joanna Inglis. I'm from Eurocommerce Retailers and Wholesalers for Europe. Um, on the topic, again, of freedom and constraints, um, as we've probably made clear, um, we're facing some constraints when it comes to where we are allowed to source products to be able to provide reasonably priced products to consumers and how we're allowed to negotiate uh, contract contractual terms between us and our suppliers. More, more of that we'll hear from us, I'm sure, in the future. But for you, in terms of thinking about constraints and barriers, if there was one constraint or barrier that you could remove that you think might really strengthen and depthen the single market between now and the end of the next mandate, what would it be? And it could be psychological, leg legislative, financial, political, anything. Okay, I will let our panel ruminate on that and we'll take the next question. I'll take the three together, yeah. Does it work? Okay. Paolo Pasimeni, European Commission. Uh, I have a qu short question to Pascal Lamy and to Enrico Letta. Some people say that the WTO is dead. That is probably an overstatement. However, I wonder how should the single market change and evolve to adapt to a world in which probably the WTO is less relevant than it used to be? 
Thanks. Thank you. And if you can pass the microphone forward, we have one just in the middle here. The gentleman is standing up. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, uh, Roberto Rigetti from the Union Syndicale Fédérale. Um, um, well, Jacques Delors' legacy uh, is very important, and uh, he managed, at least in part, I mean, to, uh, I mean, his, the idea of single uh, market, I mean, was a, quite a success. But, I mean, the situation was completely different at that point. 92 was just after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall. There was a lot of optimism in Europe. And now we are in a complete different situation. So I am afraid I am very much in favor of all what have been, has been said. I mean, renewing economic integration is a very is a beautiful thing. But if we don't put things straight at the security level, it will, be, it will fail, according to me. So I think the most important thing, and it's something that we didn't discuss much today, mm -hmm. is to press for diplomatic conferences to solve the, at least the Ukrainian crisis because it's not normal that something like that goes ahead. It's two years now. Yeah. We are in Europe and uh, I mean, yeah. in the EU charter, the fur, the fur, one of the first things is the peace. And I mean, we cannot, we cannot uh, <laughs> speak about that if first we don't address the other issue. Okay, Thank well, you. let's let our panelists speak about that. So we've got three questions there. I'll allow you to, uh, Enrico, I'll start with you since they're probably... But very, very short, because yeah. on, the, on the question on trade, uh, I'm here with the Pope, so I will take note of what the Pope <laughs> will say. I'm, I'm just okay. uh, a bishop, a very uh, bish <laughs> peripheric bishop, so I will uh, yep. uh, take note of the Pope. Um, uh, on, the, on the topic you mentioned, I will say... One topic I would like to have in the next months solved is the for uh, a, a small entrepreneur or for a startup uh, the possibility to run and to work at European level without being obliged to have uh, a legal office and a taxation office of 20 people and 20 people because there are 27 uh, corporate laws and 27 taxation system. Because in giving him uh, this constraint, you ask him to uh, choose the 28th regime, that is the American one. So he leaves and mm -hmm. he goes to the uh, US. And on your point on defense, um, I think it is not by chance that I think I will put defense at the very first part mm. of my report as consequence of this geopolitical dimension that, as Pascal said, changed everything and, uh, and defense has to be the, the, the biggest change because we never had single market and defense together. We had uh, many other topics but not defense. So, I think uh, it is needed and I think it is also, I was in the, in the European Parliament this morning and it was the topic of the members. I was at the uh, European Council, at uh, the Council of Compet uh, experts uh, today and it was exactly the same. Uh, I think it, it can be a way, this is why I'm optimistic, because it can be the way to convince um, the leaders and the political leadership. Uh, because if we put together defense, I think it's, uh, it's enormous and we never had a similar aspect. So we uh, do not under-evaluate the strength in European terms of what we are close to do. And we, I think, never uh, did until now uh, in such a way. Uh, Monsieur Le Trade Pope, let me turn to you. <laughs> What constraint or barrier would you like to remove? And then well, the second question, I think, was how can the single market adapt to a world with a slightly weaker, shall we say, world trade organization? Uh, when an Italian friend of mine says uh, that he speaks to the Pope, <laughs> I start wondering what's exactly our relationship. I thought it was a sort of nicer brotherhood. We have. <laughs> yeah. Okay, on, on your question about WTO, A, uh, WTO is not dead. Uh, B, it's less relevant than it used to be. And the basic reason why it's less relevant than it used to be is that both the US and China are on strike. 
which is not very helpful for a global trade uh, regulation organization, but it still matters a lot for developing countries and for the EU. And third, as far as the EU is concerned, it has already adjusted to this less relevance of WTO. If you look at the evolution of trade instruments, and notably trade defense instruments, since the Juncker Commission with the first von der Leyen Commission on a sort of 10-year scale, you will see that a trade commissioner today has a trade weaponry which is five times bigger than the one I had when I was trade commissioner. So we have adjusted to that. Uh, and then that final question, I think, Gaetan and Guy, um, 1992 was a more optimistic world and security and defence. Enrico says already defence is going to be at the forefront of his recommendations. Mm -hmm. I presume you would agree that, there is, that the single market is predicated on peace um, and that that has to be delivered. Final words, Gaetan? On peace, of course, and I didn't mention it, but in all the studies and discussion with the citizen, this comes out very, very strongly, uh, of course, but also on the health, the health of our democracies. And I'm, I'm always a little bit surprised when somebody comes with the citizen's perception that we are a bit pictured as the naive person and in front of re real politics. But the reality is that tomorrow there's a, there's a European election and those who are going to vote are the citizens. And the perspectives that we have now for the European election will mean that perhaps none of what you're talking about here will be possible because of this result. So I think we also have to always keep in mind that if we want to still be ambitious, we also need to always innovate and to always look at ways to make our democracy a bit more resilient and, and, and fit for what's in front of us. Guy, you understand realpolitik. What's the implication for the single market? Well, on, on the defence union, I'm, I'm a little bit less uh, optimistic that it will be the great driver in the, in the future because now they are in the mood, uh, well, we're going to have a commissioner for defence that will solve the problem, that will not solve the problem naturally, or uh, we will, uh, because of Trump, uh, increase our uh, expenditures in NATO to 2%. Will that solve the problem? That will not solve the problem because the duplication will only increase in, in Europe. So to start with uh, defence, we need a real defence union. And not to start at the end. We start always at the end. And we say, yeah, uh, uh, we need common procurement, we need co a more integrated industry in defence. Well, the, the way to do it is first create a defence union and have uh, combined uh, uh, European military units, as was foreseen in the 50s, in 54, uh, in the initial plan to have a defence union. That was... Uh, torpedoed in the French National Assembly, as uh, we all know. So that is the way to do it, and not in the, in the other way. Look what is happening now. There are, we, we're going to buy, no, we're going to buy with, can, no, the Czechs are going to buy with Canadian money uh, 800,000 shells in South Africa and in South Korea. That's the defense <laughs> union for the moment in, in Europe, huh? uh, because we cannot fulfill uh, our commitment uh, to Ukraine that was done so many months uh, uh, ago. And the way to solve that is not this whole story about ah, 2%, 2%, 2%. We are spending already, <coughs> together with the UK, more than three, if I, I put the UK inside, more than 300 billion uh, euro every year on defense. We are spending three times more than Russia on defense. We spend more with the UK than China on defence. The problem is not the level of expenditure. The, not the problem is not to start with common procurement. The, first, the defence union. Put all these assets together. Create a real European army, like it was foreseen uh, in, in, in 54, in, in 55. Everything is, uh, is on paper, so you need simply to copy it. <laughs> That's all what you need uh, uh, to do and to overcome the na French National Assembly, naturally, uh, 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 to, uh, uh, to have it. But and, and my, my fear is we start again in the opposite way. Eh? Ah, let's uh, appoint a commissioner for defence that will solve the problem, solve nothing at all. Let's increase a common procurement. No, you have first to create the, 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 the hardware uh, of a defence union in Europe and then maybe we, we will be uh, capable... Uh, 
to do something without the Americans. Enrico, the only question I didn't ask you was, uh, what are your recommendations <laughs> for the single market? <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I didn't ask that, because no, I presume it could be it's another too phone late. book. Yeah, it's too late. I'm um, sorry. But the but he has thank to you so now. much <laughs> for coming along and uh, talking They're to us today. They're waiting for me in Bruges. <laughs> They're waiting for you in Bruges. Well, please thank all our panellists for their attention. There is a reception. Please network, please share using the hashtag single market and please download the joint statement. <laughs>